It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of August 25th, 1995. All nine of them. It's a big weekend for movies. We've got a lot of them to get to, so I'm not even going to waste any more of your time. We're just going to jump on a new one. We're going to start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, the second part of Robert Rodriguez's Mexico trilogy, Antonio Bandera starring as El Mariachi in Desperado. He was visiting a bar, and then he walked. You saw his face? His face? No. I mean, every step he took towards the light, just when you thought his face was about to be revealed, it wasn't. It was as if the lights dimmed just for him. They call him a loner. I know who you are. You kill drug dealers. I kill the woman I love. They ruin my life. They call him a miss. You've heard stories of that man that carries a guitar case full of weapons. Find him and kill him. I hope you don't think you can take someone like Ucho all by yourself. Really? They made the mistake of calling his bluff. Is there something in the guitar case? A guitar? No. It's time to face the music. Let's play. Desperado is, of course, the sequel to Robert Rodriguez's previous film, El Mariachi, which put him on the map. And uh, this is definitely a much bigger movie than that movie, to the point where El, Mar El Mariachi himself is not played by the same actor, although he does appear in this movie. This is Antonio Banderas now starring in the lead role, and it was also the film that was also the breakout role for Salma Hayek. And um, there's a lot of action in this movie, a lot of really good action, too. It may be a little bit too big for its own good, but at the same time, there's still more than enough there to really enjoy this movie. This is a really fun, amazing film with a lot of good action sequences all around. Great performances by Banderas and Hayek. You got a cast that also includes Steve Buscemi, Cheech Marin, Quentin Tarantino. The pieces are there for something really great here, and there are definitely a lot of times where that is the case. But like I said before, it does get a little bit too big for its own good on various occasions throughout the course of the film. And it struggles a little bit in the story department. It's kind of stuff that we've seen done over and over again in movies like this. But at the same time, there's definitely a lot to really admire about this movie. There's so much fun with the action sequences, the directing style of Robert Rodriguez, the acting all around. It's still more than enough to really recommend it. I wouldn't say it's better than El Mariachi, but it is still a pretty solid film all around. I can't recommend it enough. If you love El Mariachi, you're definitely going to love this movie. Desperado, definitely check it out. So... Uh, with that said, on to the next movie, and that is Clyde Barker's Lord of Illusions. On August 25th, Clyde Barker invites you to witness the future of terror. Clive Barker's Lord of Illusions. Rated R. Starts Friday, August 25th at theaters everywhere. Most notable for being Clive Barker's last film he directed as the, the main director on it. The other two he did was Nightbreed and, of course, the more successful Hellraiser. Uh, I have not seen this movie, so I can't really say too much about it. Uh, from what I've seen here, it was supposed to be the start of a new franchise. Scott Bakula has the leading role in this. Uh, you also have Famke Jansen, who would later be seen in GoldenEye the following year, is later in the year. But it was pretty clear that this was supposed to be the next big horror franchise. They thought that this was going to be the next Hellraiser. But um, the reviews for this were not looking so good, and the film didn't do gangbuster business at the box office. So 
I guess they didn't. They decided not to do these movies, but um, I mean, from the look at it, it looks like it has a visually pleasing look to it. But uh, other than that, though, I can't really say too much more about it because, like I said, I haven't seen it. I don't usually get into these horror movies as much as everybody else does, but um, it does look a little bit promising, though. But um, yeah, other than that, though, Clive Barker's Lord of Illusions can't really say much about it, but um, has some promise to it. So. Uh, with that said, let's move on to the next movie, and that is the family film, The Amazing Panda Adventure. Summers is in the jungle of China. This reserve was set up in order to save the panda. Now, with a little help from a friend, he will attempt the impossible and save the pandas. The Amazing Panda Adventure, in PG. Plus, Warner Brothers' brand new animated short. Watch out, dog. Carrot Blanca, Lady G. Only with the Amazing Panda Adventure. Both start Friday, August 25th at a theater near you. So much like with the kid in King Arthur's Court two weeks ago, this is probably one of those movies that if I had seen it in theaters when it came out, I probably would have stayed for the for the Looney Tunes short and then left after the movie because the Amazing Panda Adventure, there ain't nothing too amazing about it. I mean, it has some nice visuals to it. It's got a nice story to it, but it's really nothing all that spectacular. It's kind of a, it's kind of like the free will, the equivalent of Free Willy from the way instead of it being a whale this time, it's a panda. And there are moments where there are some fun little moments here and there, but the movie itself is just mostly forgettable. I mean, the one thing that you come out of this remembering the most was, like I said, that Looney Tunes short, Carrot Blanca, which that was my introduction to Casablanca. And I think that was a lot of kids' introduction to Casablanca in the 90s. A lot of moviegoers' first love of, his first love of Casablanca came from Carrot Blanca, I would assume. Um, that was the one that, that was the short that made me want to see Casablanca. And, it's one of my favorite movies of all time, and it was mostly because of what I saw from Carrot Blanca, which is a brilliantly funny adaptation, a parody of the, of the film, and it has the great music of Richard Stone from Animaniacs and Tiny Toons, the great voice cast that includes uh, Greg Burson, Joe Alasky, uh, the classic Looney Tune people behind it. It's just a great short, and it's just every time I watch it, it's still very funny, it's still very creative, it's still very memorable. Like I said, it's the one thing you take away from this. Like once again, I had that theory that they put these movie, they put these shorts on these really bad movies because they want people to think that everything that was on this one package was just a bad thing, and it really wasn't. And um, yeah, like I said, Carrot Blanca would probably have been the only th reason to go see this movie on a big screen. Other than that, the Amazing Panda Adventure itself is just—it's a mixed bag film, mostly not that great. But like, but like I said, I've seen a lot worse compared to this. It's basically a not a free willy version. It's basically the panda equivalent to free willy is what I'm trying to say. So, and uh, even then, it's not really all that great. So uh, that's the amazing panda adventure. Let's move on to the next movie, and that is John Borman's Beyond Rangoon. In this ancient land, in this forbidden place, Laura Bowman went to the ends of the earth to live the adventure of a lifetime. From acclaimed director John Borman comes the epic story of one woman's unforgettable journey beyond Rangoon. Rated R. At theaters August 25th. I have not seen this movie, and I don't think a lot of people really did. And even if they did, they probably don't remember it. This was directed by John Borman, who also did Deliverance. But this is not one of his more memorable films. Uh... The movie is about Patricia Arquette playing an American tourist who vac vacations in the country of Burma in 1988, the year of the 8088 of the 8888 uprising. And the movie mostly is filmed in Malaysia and is more notable for what happened beyond the, what's on the screen because only weeks into the European release of the film, the Burmese military junta freed Nobel Peace Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi, who was depicted in the film after several years under strict house arrest. The celebrated democracy thanked the filmmakers in her first interview with the BBC, and Suki was rearrested a few years later, but Beyond Rangoon had already helped to raise world attention on a previously invisible tragedy, the massacres of 1988, and the cruelty of her country's military rulers. So, I guess in a way there is some history to this film, but other than that, though, the adaptation itself is not really all that strong, and you have uh, Patricia Arquette leading the charge along with Francis McDormand and Spalding Gray for some reason. Um, it's just a movie that does not look like it had any memorability factor to it. And judging by the fact that nobody really knew about this movie for, when they went to go see it, and it's gotten the mixed reception since then, I doubt that this movie made a, a, that much of an impact here. But 
where this movie took place, there pro there was a lot there to be taken from. So, I guess there is something to it, even though there's there's something to it, but at the same time, there really isn't. It's kind of a mixed bag film, judging from what I've seen here. Like I said, I haven't seen it, so I can't really say too much about it. Who knows? Maybe the movie actually is pretty good, or maybe it's just what I think it is. Just a film that did what it had to do and then just got out there, so... So, um, yeah, Beyond Rangoon. Uh, let's move on to the next movie that we have here, and that is the documentary, The Show. Once upon a time, not long ago, when people wore pajamas and lived life's life. I don't want to come visit no, no rappers in jail. I'm saying, for what? It sold a million, too. I, I wish, you know, I... I mean, it's supposed to be, I mean, I'm, I'm not no, no role model, I'm not, I'm not trying to be, you know, but I don't think... You know, if you got all that success, you got you can't, you know. And I want, you know, I always tell artists, you know, it's all right to be, you know, to be real. Real is, you know, everybody say, I wish I got to where you got. If I got to where you got, I would not be throwing no guns in nobody's faces or robbing nobody or none of that. Or just you just being in, somebody got to be for me, believe me, they could go. I'm only going to see Ricky because of the movie. I'm saying that's the only reason I'm, can't cut, you got to cut it out? Well, you should make it real. Come on, and, and you know, I don't understand. I'm older though, I'm 37 years old. I want to chase, I want to, you know, I want to travel around the world and chase famous models. I'm still always going to be ghetto. I'm too old not to be. You know what I'm saying? I'm who I am, but I ain't got to do, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm not broke, so I ain't got to throw no guns in nobody's faces for nothing. So this is a hip-hop documentary film. You just saw Russell Simmons in there. He stars in this and narrates the film, but most notably about this movie is that it's directed by the current president of Paramount Pictures, and that is Brian Robbins. Him and Michael Tolan, who had done all that at this point, and they had done Keenan and Kel, were about to do Good Burger. They d did this documentary, and Russell Simmons isn't the only big name attached to this. Um, features a lot of hip-hop's biggest names, including uh, Notorious B.I.G., Sean Puppy Combs, Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, Warren G., Kid Capri, L.O. Cool J., Method Man, Naughty by Nature, Run DMC, uh, Twins, Wu-Tang Clan... Everybody is in this movie. Everyone that was mostly involved with Def Jam Records, because, of course, uh, Russell Simmons is the founder of Def Jam Records. So, uh, Like I said, I haven't seen the movie, so I can't really say too much about it, but um, it's definitely got a lot of interesting elements to it, like the fact that it's directed by Brian Robbins and it has some notable names from this time period. And I don't know, it could be something very interesting to see, but um, like I said, I don't know too much more about it. I just know that it came out this weekend, so that's why I'm covering it here. For, for right now so that's the show let's move on to the next movie that we have here and that is tim daly and sean young in the comedy dr jekyll and miss hyde a century ago dr henry jekyll tried to alter the gene responsible for mankind's violent and sexual behavior instead his miscalculation unleashed the dark side of his own nature Three generations later... To my great-nephew Richard, I leave my grandfather's scientific notebooks. His great-grandson would try to improve upon the formula. Cheers. But once again, things didn't go according to plan. Are you all right? Don't be ridiculous. Dr. Jax. I've got... I've got to go. Now, everyone's about to see a side of Dr. Jax. Richard! They've never seen before. Are you just going to stand there and stare at me, or are you going to hand me that towel? I'm going to stand here and stare at you. I'm Richard's new assistant, Helen Hyde. Welcome aboard. This is your night, Good Blossom. She's making his life... <laughs> I'm a genius! A little confusing. Uh, uh, what am I talking about? Because he never knows when she's coming back. Uh. Now, he'll have to get rid of her. This video will better document my metabolic transformation into Helen Hyde. Richard! This is not what it seems like before she gets rid of him. I warned you, Richard. Uh, uh. Don't mess with me. Hilda, you still know how to throw a party. Sean Young. You know, I've got a caulking gun, because that ain't going to do it. Tim Daly. Helen and her damn thongs. Dr. Jekyll and Ms. Hyde. Sweetheart. Mr. Monkey wants to play. Ah! 
Man, somewhere in this movie there is a good hook to this. I mean, a, f a m movie where the h the hide in this movie is actually someone of the opposite sex. I mean, that's something that could be really funny. A guy turning into a woman. And that should be something really interesting and really funny. But, man, this movie is just messed up on so many levels. I remember watching this on Comedy Central back in the day. And, um, yeah, it's much more... It's more bizarre and more weirder than you could possibly imagine. And... The fact that they did this with a PG, th I think the first thing that's wrong with this is that it's rated PG thirteen. So this is a this is a story that should have been rated R. Like a guy turning into a woman. I mean, I mean, I don't think you can get do a lot with a PG thirteen rating when you're trying to also bring the kids into this as well. Because man, that's just a, that was just something that's messed up altogether. Second of all, um, a good idea botched botched up by really lackluster writers. I mean. Yes, you have William Davies and William Osborne, who also wrote the Twins, who's wrote, written a lot of great stuff. Twins, the Johnny English movies, Flushed Away, How to Train Your Dragon, Pushed in Boots. I mean, there are good, some good writers attached to this, but man, it definitely does not show here. Third, the visual effects in this movie are just, wow, those look terrible. Like, they really, really look bad. And, um, I mean, I guess the fourth biggest problem with the movie is that Eddie Murphy did it better the next year with The Nutty Professor. I mean... It's not, I mean, it's not the same, same idea, but it is, it is just, it is a much better movie. It has better visual effects, it has a better usage of the visual effects than this movie does. Which is amazing to think about when you really look at this, because, like, with $8 million, you should be at least be able to get something out of the, these effects. But you saw how they were in the trailer, they looked absolutely terrible, they looked really awful. It also doesn't help that the movie just doesn't look funny at all, it just goes for the straight out, gross out humor... And again, it can't go all the way with it because it's PG-13 and they want to try to get the kids in here, which, for an idea like this, it just doesn't work. Plus, some of that comedy is just so lame. It's just so lackluster, cliched comedy. We've seen this done over and over again. And once it's, as then, most of the time, it wasn't even funny the first time around. But, um, I mean, I mean, what more do I need to say about this movie? This is a film that had some high ambitions to it, but... It, one didn't have the money to do it to make it to really succeed. Two, it didn't have a good story. Three, there wasn't enough good comedy. And four, the Nutty Professor did it better one year later. That's really all you got to say about this one. But um, yeah, so that's Doctor Jekyll and Miss Hyde for you. So let's move on to a much better movie, a one a better movie with a much more interesting story, and that is Richard Williams, The Thief and the Cobbler. And we're gonna delve into the long history of this after this. From the Academy Award-winning animator of Who Framed Roger Rabbit comes an extraordinary new adventure. Behold the wonders of Arabian Night. Journey to a faraway land guarded by magic. We are safe from any threat as long as those three golden balls are on the minaret. Where a wicked wizard schemes to steal the throne. The world is mine to take! And a thick-headed thief paves the way for disaster. The balls are gone! Now, only the courage of a beautiful princess. But she is more than this. The determination of a humble shoemaker. What is your name? I'm Tack. And the help of some outrageous new friends. I am ruthless, the chieftain. Can save an enchanted kingdom. Get ready to battle the one-eyes. <laughs> Boogie with the brigands. And go for the gold. With the first animated motion picture created in widescreen cinemascope in over three decades. Featuring the lyrics of Oscar-winning songwriter Norman Gimbel and the voices of Vincent Price. Gentlemen, what a delight. And Jonathan Winters. Good Arabian Night. So Arabian Night was one of the many titles that this movie was going under. Uh, this is co-written and directed by Richard Williams. It was originally convinced, started 
production back in the 1960s. It went in and out of production for three decades, mostly because of the independent funding and the ambitious and the ambitiously complex animation that went involved went into the involvement of it. Uh, shortly after Who Framed Roger Rabbit really put Richard Williams on the map, he was finally re able to put this movie into production when Warner Brothers said that they would put it out. And then production went over budget and behind schedule. They cut, and then it was eventually cut down, hastily re-edited by other people without Richard Williams' involvement in it. And then the Completion Bond Company wrapped up production on it without Richard Williams ever know knowing about the movie being finished. And eventually got a release in 1993 under Allied Filmmakers with The Princess and the Cobbler. And then two years later came here to America finally under the name Arabian Night. And both versions of the film did not do well critically or financially and um it's a shame too because there is so much of ambition with this movie this is one of the films with the longest production timelines ever and some notable names and artists that worked on this movie this is the last thing they ever worked on ken harris died in 82 he was a looney tunes writer animator um emory hawkins was another one involved with this uh kenneth williams was involved with this vincent price died two years before the film uh, two years before the film came out, one month before the film's initial release. I mean, in a way, this movie somehow became a knockoff of Aladdin, even though it was created long before Aladdin ever came out. I mean, and when you look at the movie, the, there is a lot of high ambition with the animation. The animation in this is incredible. Like, it's really solid animation all around. And it's really something amazing to look at. Unfortunately, the, stor is the story is just all over the place. And then you add in the fact that they have these voice actors come in. You have Jonathan Winters as the thief. And because the genie made pop culture references in Aladdin, now we got to have this thief made pop culture references talking about, is, I'm going to go to Disneyland. It's just like, it's, you get little jokes like that here and there. And um, it doesn't help that the princess in this movie is not written very well as a character. Uh, the cobbler is kind of annoying in the movie. Jennifer Beals plays the co plays the princess, and the cobbler is played by Matthew Broderick. And there's a pointless narration to Broderick's character that just it just feels like the movie was dumbing itself down. Like they didn't have any intent on making this the movie that Richard Williams wanted it to make. But um, uh, luckily, somebody did. Some people actually went ahead and made versions of this. Uh, they wanted to restore the film to its original version, including Roy E. Disney. Uh, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences actually archived Williams' 35mm work print and acknowledges the film's rehabilitated reputation due to projects like the Recobbled Cut, which you can find online, which is a very well-done fan edit of what this movie was originally intended to be. Definitely go seek that out if you can. And also there's a documentary called per Persistence of Vision that talks about the production of this movie by Kevin Shrek, who also was a, one of the people that worked on the Mad TV series for Cartoon Network. There's a lot of things to talk about with this movie, but the version that I saw, the, the DVD, the one that I recently got the DVD for, the one that went to theaters under Miramax Films, it's definitely not a good movie. It's mostly because of the stuff that they added in. The animation can look really great, but, man, the the voice work, the characters they add in here, it's not, the, the characters are so lackluster, the story is pretty generic, like... It's really a really bad version of this story. If you're going to watch this movie, go out and seek the Recobble Cut. Seek the documentary on this. Find any other version but the one that we got on DVD the first time around. Because, yeah, the animation can look really great on it, but it's not worth it for the stuff that they at the Completion Bond Company added it. Because it is not a well-made film whatsoever where that cuts. But like I said, find the Recobble Cut. Find the Persistence of Vision documentary. And hopefully, maybe one day we'll finally get the version that Richard Williams had always intended to make. Um, you never know. Stranger things have happened. But um, So that's The Thief and the Cobbler. Let's move on to the next movie that we have here, and that is Nausea. Nights. Nights without sleep. Long nights in which the brain lights up like a big city. <laughs> I kill somebody. That concerns you, right? They didn't say who, just how a stake in the heart. I killed a fiend who is not dead. He's undead. I want to change my life. I'll find someone. I'll be happy. <laughs>
we got David Lynch's name on it, so you know it's going to be something very dark and disturbing. And um, you have a movie here that's basically kind of a, a noir film, a vampire film, vampire noir film, I should say, that treats genre elements in an understated art house style. That's Peter Fonda playing Abraham Van Helsing. And, um, I mean, that's really all I know about this movie because I haven't seen it, but um, it looks intriguing. It looks very interesting. It looks something very different. It, look, it kind of reminds me a little bit of... Um, uh, that John Landis vampire film that came out a few years prior, Innocent Blood. It has that kind of a gothic feel to it. Very underrated movie, by the way. I talked about it previously on a previous episode. If you want to see that, take a look at it on the corner here. But um, this looks very different. This looks very unique. Um, I might check it out one day. But um, yeah, like I said, I haven't really seen it, so I don't know too much about it. But it definitely has my intrigue just on the stuff that I see in the director, the per, the per, people who made it, the person who's playing Abraham Van Helsing, and the fact that David Lynch is involved with it, this could be pretty interesting. So, uh, with that said, on to the last movie that we have here, and that is Theremin, an electronic odyssey. documentary talking about the life of Leon Theremin and his invention, the aforementioned Theremin, a pioneering electronic musical instrument. It follows his life, including being imprisoned in a Soviet gulag, the influence of his instrument, which came to define the sound of eerie and 20th century movies, and influenced popular music as it searched for and celebrated electronic music in the 1960s. It sounds like a very intriguing documentary, honestly. Um, but like I said, I haven't really seen it before. I haven't really n known anything about this movie. I didn't even know it existed before I even looked at this. But this definitely has a lot of interesting aspects to it that could be pretty inter pretty amazing to watch. So uh, definitely one I, w I will have on my radar. But like I said, I haven't seen it, so I can't really say too much about it. But um came out this weekend. But uh, yeah, so Theremin Electronic Odyssey. And on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. Next time we meet, we'll jump into Labor Day weekend 1995 with three movies, including Christopher Walken and The Prophecy, The Family Adventure, Magic in the Water, and also The Innocence. So three movies to look at next time around. We'll delve into those on the next episode. But until then, thank you very much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the playlist on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And I'll see you guys tomorrow for another episode. So thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. And until then, as always, take care.